Morning. Morning. Now that we're rolling. <clears throat> Do appreciate again all the men that have taken the time to uh, go through the book of John, be able to bring our different perspectives, be able to talk about his word. Now, I was preparing for my lesson, I came across an account that I thought was, was quite interesting. Back in 1981, when I was about two years old, a man flown, or, uh, was making preparations to uh, be flown into the, the tundra of Alaska, into a, into a remote part of the wilderness. His purpose was to uh, photograph the natural beauty and the animals in the area. Uh, he made uh, all the right preparations. He uh, got, gathered all his photo equipment, 500 rolls of film, several firearms, 1,400 pounds of provisions. And, uh, he got dropped off in the 
pretty much the middle of nowhere. As the months passed, he uh, kept a diary. And uh, in August, his, uh, he talked about his fascination with the wildlife, everything that was going great. Um, but uh, at the end of August, it dawned on him, he wrote, he's like, I think I should have uh, used more foresight about arranging my departure. I'll soon find out. He was so gung-ho to get in there and get stuff done, he forgot about how to get out of the area he was getting into. Time passed, and he waited and waited, and he was thinking, you know, somebody might come to rescue him. Well, in November, <clears throat> in November he died in a nameless valley by a nameless lake, 225 miles northeast of Fairbanks. An investigation revealed that he had carefully provided for his adventure all the provisions, but he had made no provisions to be flown out of the area. A little bit of a foresight on, uh, on his part. And you think about this. Many people live their lives without making any plans for the departure into the other realm. You live your life fully in this world without thinking about the next. And I came across this on the internet, so you know it's true. It said the statistics on death are quite impressive. <laughs> We're all not going to get out of here alive. Unless Jesus splits the sky and things happen, each and every one of us is going to taste a physical death. But yet, you know, think about that. Are we, are, we, are we living this life, the right here and now, the adventure part of it? Are we, are we make, making every provision for today and not thinking about eternity? I mean, that's, that's a question that each and every one of us really needs to ask. I mean, what, what's your perspective? Are you living with an eternal perspective? Are you living with this perspective for today? One of the books that I've been uh, fascinated with, you guys are going to think I'm crazy. This last week, I've been, last couple of weeks, I've been fascinated with the book of Ecclesiastes. Man, I, I just can't get enough of that book. And I remember a long time ago, Marshall made the comment, I think it was back in the Bible study or something, he's like, man, he's like, Ecclesiastes is such a downing book. It's just such a downer. I mean, if you, if you read Ecclesiastes and you're like, man, what, what's the point of this whole book? What, what, Sol, what Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, what his whole point of this book is, he's trying to show if you live a life of futility and foolishness, of just of this life, without an eternal perspective, you really have no hope. And that's really what the basis of the book is all about. You think he came to this conclusion right off the go. Says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What he's trying to look at, he's try he looked at every different aspect of his life. What made him happy or tried to make him happy, tried to make him fulfilled. And at the end of the day, he's like, if there's nothing more than this, this is just hopelessness. There's, there's nothing here that's going to sustain you. It's just... It's all vanity. It's, just, it's all fluff. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes. I have to go there. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. If you're not sure of where it's at, you hit Proverbs, it's next book over. Like I said, I, I spent a lot of time in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse, 11, or verse 1. Read a little bit here. I said to myself, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself, and behold, it too was futility. I said of laughter, It is madness, and of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine, and while my mind was guiding me wisely in how to take hold of folly, until I could see what good there is for the sons of men do to under heaven the few years of their lives. I enlarged my works. I built my houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. And I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had home-born slaves. I also possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. I also collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men. 
many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me, and all that my eyes desired I did not refuse them. I did not, hold with, with, uh, I did not, did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was no profit under the sun. Drop down to verse 18. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it for the man who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool, yet he will have control over all the fruits of my labor for which I have labored, by acting wisely under the sun, this too is vanity. What he was doing was he was looking at all the things that his flesh could have pleasure with. And he was saying, you know what? This is all this vanity. If there's nothing past this, then why should I labor so hard? Because the, per- when, the wise man and the fool are all going to be dust of the earth. I'm going to leave everything that I've done to the person behind me. I mean, isn't that kind of like the world's perspective? Get all that you can for today because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I mean, that's how the world lives out their life. If you don't have an eternal perspective about what you're doing, what's the point? I want each and every one of us, and this is including myself, I want you to take a good long look at your life. Are you living for today? Are you striving after when for today? Or do you have an eternal perspective? Do you have plans five, ten years down the road? Do you know where you want the church body to be? Where do you see yourself in the church body? Or are you just showing up on Sunday to fill your spot in the pew? It's a question each one of us has to ask. What are we living for? I can't answer that for you, but I just pray that at the end of my days, when I am dust to the earth, I can look back at my life and say, you know what? I wasn't striving after wind. I had an eternal perspective. I was trying to help those around me to have that eternal perspective and get to the other side. That's what we all want. But what does that look like? John, chapter 12. We have a great example left by us by our Lord and Savior. John, chapter 12. Verse 24. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you. It's trying. It's truly, truly. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Pay attention. Truly, truly, I say to you. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He was talking about his life. He was talking about the sacrifices that he was going to make. Ultimately, he was talking about his, uh, his walk to Calvary and how he was going to give himself up completely. When you look at Christ's life, he did nothing just on a whim. It's almost like everything was calculated to have the biggest bang, to be able to help those around him. He had an eternal perspective completely and totally all the time. Day in, day out. And I've said this multiple times. He just didn't wake up one day and knew he was going to take on Calvary. He just didn't shoot out of bed and say, yep, today's the day. This was years and years and years in the process. Day after day after day, controlling the mind, controlling the body. Constantly just, you know, buffering the body, buffeting the mind. But he had an eternal perspective. He knew what, was, what, was it, what the cost was. He knew that he had to be the perfect sacrifice. He had to give of himself completely. He had to deny self daily. A great example of this, and we'll be getting into this in uh, John chapter 13, is where he took a towel and a water basin and washed the disciples' feet. Now, if you think about this, you think about king shouldn't have to wash somebody's feet. That was more like a servant's job. But what he was doing is he was setting, a, he was setting an example for his disciples to follow. 
he wanted to say, you know what, I'm going to lay aside self to help one another, to help you. This is an example he left behind for each and every one of us to look at and say, you know what, am I doing that for somebody else? Am I laying aside myself and my desires to be able to help somebody else? The culmination of Jesus dying to self was when he laid down his life at Calvary. He laid down his life at Calvary completely by himself so he could pick it back up. But just think of the sacrifice that was made. My mind always, my mind always goes to when he turned his, mind, turned his face towards Jerusalem. When he turned his face towards Jerusalem and knew that the, that was the path that he had to walk, he had to walk to Jerusalem. If you knew the day that you were going to die, if you knew when seven days from now was going to be the day that you were going to die, how hard would each step towards Jerusalem be? Think about that. How hard was each step? Because he knew each step he took, he was getting one foot closer. One foot closer. I mean, you can just see the determination in his face. I just see that it's just like a rock, like flint, I think it's described in the scriptures. Think of that mindset that he had to have. Man, I got scared in the elevator going up to the 103rd floor of the, the Sears building. Man, I was shaking like a leaf. My wife's like, what's wrong with you? I go, I'm scared. Leave me alone. And that was just in one day. Cause, oh, well, they told us, oh, tomorrow we're going up to the 103rd story. Man, I was, the, the day before, I was trying to come up with excuses not to get into it. And, man, we jumped on, we jumped on the bus. I'm like, I'm getting closer. And then the tour guide... Bless his heart. We got in front of the Sears building. You see, see that way up there? That little, little bit of glass sticking out? That's where you can be standing. He's like, anybody that walks out on that ledge this morning don't need coffee. Thank, thanks, buddy. <laughs> we got off the bus. I mean, every step closer, I'm just thinking in my mind, how can I get out of this? What kind of excuse can I stay to stay in the basement of this place? You know, I don't want to go up to the 103rd floor. We got in the elevator, and I swear... There are 50 people cramming this elevator. They say they're not, but I say yes because I'm an energy designer and I know space. And I know how much people take up space. So I'm saying there's 50. I'm holding, I, Elijah was scared too. He was crying. I'd take him to the bathroom, calm him down and pray. I prayed for both of us. <laughs> he's crying on the way up, man. I'm, I'm sitting there holding his hand. He's calming down. I'm sitting there. I'm just, at least like, what is your, I'm shaking. I'm like, I'm moving. Because in my mind, I, I told her, seriously, I told her, I go, leave me alone. <laughs> and, he, he, and you want to know why? Do you want to know why? Because I had to get in here. I had to get in here to calm the rest of this down. I wasn't that bad on the first flight to Belarus. Inside, man, I, my mind was going nuts, but I was able to talk myself down. But that's what you, he had to do. He had to set his face towards Jerusalem. Every step closer, he knew what it was going to be. He knew that he was going to get tortured. He knew he was going to get beaten. He came into that city like a king, and he left mutilated, beat up. Nobody knew who he was, carrying that cross to Calvary. Where do you think his mind was at? It wasn't on you. It was on glory. He had to get his mind fixed there. I'm, that's where I'm going. That's what it takes. Mind over the body. And that's what he's saying here. He's like, this is what I'm going to do. I have to die in order for the fruit to come. You are going to have to do the exact same thing. I'm leaving an example for you to follow. Now my verses. That was my warm-up. <laughs> 25 and 26. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where, in, where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor me. The instruction from heaven is clear. If a person chooses heaven, it will cost him earth. If he chooses earth, it will cost him heaven. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world should keep it to life eternal. Truly, truly, I say to you, heed these words. What's your perspective? What's your purpose? 
Are you living for today? Are you willing to give up this today? Do you have eternity tomorrow with the Lord? Or do you want to grab all the fruits that this world has to offer you and give up eternity with our Lord and be in the smoking section, as Mr. Harbour likes to say? It's a choice. Each one of us has that choice. He set before you life and death. That's what he says in Deuteronomy. I set before you life and death. You have free will. What are you going to do? What are you going to choose? He knows what your choice is going to be. I heard it said once by a preacher. Do you want to know where you end up? Would you like to know? His thing was, he's like, I don't want to know. Because you know what? That was my choice. My choice has led me to that. That was a great, that was a great thought. It's like, my choice has led me to the end goal. So this is a choice set for you. Life and death. Earth and heaven. So let's look at both sides of this. Love your life in this world or hate your life in this world. <clears throat> Loving your life in this world means living with this life only in view. Luke chapter 12. read these verses this is, this is him writing to me talking to me this is, I don't think he's talking to the unsaved you know he's talking to the disciples he's like you have a choice set before you these are warnings I believe in my, from my understanding I'd say these are warnings for us what are you, are you going to let the world sweep you away or are you going to have your mind fixed on him because Satan's going to do everything he can to pull your mind down back to the earth. Luke chapter 12, 16 through 21. And behold them a parable, uh, and he told them a parable saying, The land of a certain rich man was very productive. He began reasoning to himself saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? He said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and I will build larger ones. And there I will store up all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. And drink, take your ease, uh, take your ease, drink, eat, drink, and be merry. Is that kind of the perspective of this world? I have so much crops. I have so much stuff, so much money that I can't put it in my house. You know, I'll, I'll build a bigger one. You know what? I'm so well off right now. I have so much money in the bank account that I can retire early and I can just... He's living for the world. He's putting all these things in for the world. He's like, he's living for today and what the world has to offer him. Uh, verse 20. God said to him, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is a man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You may be rich on this earth. You may have all these nice things. What's God really more concerned about? He's more concerned about where you're at, you know, after the other, on the other side of that. If you're just living for this world and everything else, then you know what? He knows, he knows what's going to happen. That you're living for this life, this life, or this world. This world is going to ultimately take your life as it did this guy if you're living for just the goods. Loving your life in this world means living for the same things people in this world live for. First John. First John chapter two. Again, I'm gonna keep harping on this point. I think this is for us to look at our lives. What are you living for? We may know the truth, but are you living for, are you just trying to store up stuff for this world that eventually is going to burn away and the fool and the wise man is going to end up in the same place? Or are you having the eternal perspective? John chapter 2, 15, and 7, 15 through 17. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. 
and the world is passing away in all its lust, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Man, this world has some really nice stuff in it. There's some really great things in this world. There's things in this world that will make your life ten times easier. Do you love them? Think about this. I was trying to remember what it was like not to have a smartphone. Do you love your smartphone? Think about it. Um, all the things a smartphone can do. Phone, camera, radio, calculator, GPS, internet, connection to my banking accounts, video games for the kids in the pews when they're starting to act unruly here, take this for a few minutes, keep you quiet so I can listen to Mr. Harvard preach. Think of all the the luxuries this world has to offer. Do you love them? Are you willing to set them aside to do the will of God? I mean, don't get me wrong. Each and every one of us has our own interests. We all know uh, Mr. Harbour's a big Michigan fan. But if it came over to watching the game or doing God's will, I know he's going to DVR the game and watch it at a more convenient time. (laughs) Which we know you do. (laughs) Because we get text messages saying, don't tell me the end of the game. (laughs) We're all allowed to have our own things that we find relaxing, are able to recharge our batteries. And even those interests we're able to use to help people outside the church be able to be able to get together with them, be able to have fun with one another, even with the own saints. I don't know if I was invited or invited myself Friday night. Dean and Denise came over to uh, the, uh, the Downing's house. Guess what we did for fellowship? We shucked corn. <laughs> because Denise never did it before and she wanted to know the process of doing corn if I said hey Marshall you want to come over and shuck some corn there's a Michigan game on I gotta go watch <laughs> I don't like wrestling but I'll take it up now some other sport but you get my point you don't want to have the things of this world sweep you away You don't want to have the things that you enjoy take up all of your time. You want to be able to set those things aside, be able to watch them or do them later. Again, what is, what is, I love the the whole shucking, for some reason I love shucking corn, but I enjoyed the fellowship with Dean and Denise more. That was the ultimate reason why I was there. I never really sat down and talked with either one. And I, I, I had the tour. I was voluntold to go get the Chinese. And uh, you got that, did you? <laughs> Dean's like, hey. He's like, jump in my car. I'll take you. I've only had maybe one or two minute conversations with Dean. I learned more about Dean in that 20 minutes I was with him and some of his interests than I ever did before. Was that meaningful for him? Were we able to share our lives with one another? Yes. That was great fellowship. You know, I was there helping him shuck the corn. I talked to Denise a little bit. That was great fellowship. Great. Don't let the things of this world have that take your uh, focus away. Have it be an eternal perspective. Do you want to help those around you? The answer should be yes. But you don't want to love this world. You don't want to love the things of this world. You want to be able to love people and where they're at and where they want, what you want to be able to help them to know. Beating them over the scriptures does not help them. They hate this life. <clears throat> the, other, the other dime on, the, on that, the other perspective. To hate this life means we must take ourselves off the throne. It means we must take ourselves off the throne. We are to live for God's glory and his purpose. Even if that means sitting in the garage at your father-in-law's house shucking corn. I believe I was supposed to be there that night. That was God's purpose. We do this by submitting every thought, word, deed to the Lordship of Jesus. It means every moment, moment by moment, be able to seek God's face, be able to love him, be able to help those around you. This is a day in, day out, minute by minute thing that we have been called to do. 
You are to hate this life. To hate this life. You don't want to love things of this life. It means to give up self and pride, be able to put others ahead of your own needs. Two, th- two things to consider. Jesus says, he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. He's describing a lifelong process of dying to self day in and day out. This is a process of, uh, uh, this is a characteristic of a process of those who have truly trusted in Christ Jesus for their salvation. We understand there is nothing that we can do on our own initiative to gain eternity, to gain salvation. We understand that we need to be with him. We need to understand that we need to be able to trust in him completely and fully because of the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. Again, we need to follow him. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. This kind of goes along with my verses in John. 23 through 25. He was saying to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself. Think about the cross. Think. Jesus is the author of this world. He knew, he knows the beginning from the end. He is the one that designed the way that he was going to die. Don't you think you'd want to make it a little more quicker? A little more painless. Maybe be having his head chopped off, sent to the guillotine, getting in a plane wreck. He had chose multiple different things to to end his life with. He could have designed something completely different that we never even thought of. But you know what? He said he he designed, he authored the cross for a purpose, for a reason. This wasn't something that's just you get into real quick and it's over with. If you've done any kind of research or if you've heard anybody talk from the, from the front what it takes to go through a crucifixion, what, they knew what it meant when you pick up your cross. Have you ever studied out what scourging is? You understand that they were supposed to get you almost to the point of death they're trying to weaken your body just so you don't hang on the cross long? But even then, you're not guaranteed. You might still hang on the cross a day or two. Think about that. Think about that's that's how he authored the way for himself to die. You think there might have been a reason behind that? You think that was for us? It is. It's for us. It's it's. There's no quick way, quick path to be able to die to self. This is a day in, day out. As Mr. Har- or Mr. Doty likes to say, wake up in the morning, go down to the basement, kill the old man, and come back upstairs. you got to die to self daily. This is a race that we're in daily. We don't know when the finish line is going to be, but this is something we have to do day in and day out. We are warring against the flesh. Satan is going to put every kind of carrot every kind of luxury he can in front of you to pull your mind down back to this earth, back to self. But again, what's your eternal perspective? What was Christ's perspective? He had to die to self daily. He'd be able to put all those around him ahead of his own needs, ahead of his own desires. I mean, just get the idea of God in the flesh Kneeling down in front of you to wipe your feet. Think about that. Think about how he had to humble himself. Did he have to do it? No. But he did to set an example for us. Every day, 
Every day that we've been raised up in Christ, we still have to fight the old nature of the old man. I don't know about you, but I still struggle. There, there's some days, there, there's some good days, and there's some bad days. But you know what? I need to keep in mind that I'm taking one step forward. You know, if you have a mountain in front of you, and I told you you had to take and move that mountain, you're thinking, you're crazy. Especially if I give you a shovel. But if you take a scoop full of that mountain every day, you're able to scatter it around, aren't you able to move it eventually? What did Mr. young Mr. Harbor say something about how do you eat an elephant? You know, day after day after day, eventually you get down to eating the whole thing. You're warring against the flesh daily. Don't beat yourself up. Don't have a laundry list of all these things that you need to do. Well, make a laundry list of all the things you need to do, but just don't hit all of them at one time. Hit the top one. Hit the one that bothers your conscience the most. And be able to hit, go after that one. Because we need to die to self daily. That is a grueling task. There's no quick end to that. None of us was asked to be here. <clears throat> None of us said, hey, God, I want to be born this day and age. You know what? We just, we just ended up here. God has, God has a purpose for man. He has an eternal purpose for man. I wish I could really get into it, but I can't. But the short version of it is it's, it's not about you. It's never been about you. This is about God and Satan and the war that's going on in the other realm. And God's trying to prove a point. He made us free will to worship him freely. This all boils down to worship. Satan wanted worship, and he tried getting, getting it. It wasn't going to happen. Why do you think he went after Jesus in the, in the wilderness? You know, fall down and worship me. He knew, who, he knew who Jesus was. He knew he was God in the flesh. This is all about a worship issue. This is all about us showing that we're willing to live our lives out in faith to show this to the angels. Think about that, because if I'm an angel, I don't need to have faith in God because I'm able to be in, see him. I'm able to be around him. But we are able to live our, out our lives in obedience out of faith because we haven't ever seen God, but our spiritual eyes have, you know, seen him. But if we're willing to lose this life for his purpose, for his glory, don't you think that he's going to reward you eternally? That's what it says. He's going to reward you. Romans chapter 8. I'll finish here. Spirit himself, uh, 8.16. The Spirit himself bears witness with spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, if we put the old man to death daily, if we do all these things to be obedient for him, if we live out his purpose, we live out for his glory, we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified You want that eternal reward? You need to lose this life. You need to die to self daily. To be able to gain eternity with him. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about both Mr. Harbors being up here. It's not about butts in the pews every Sunday. This is about living out life for him completely, day after day, minute after minute, Glorifying Him. Are you willing to do that? Each and every one of us needs to ask ourselves that. What's our eternal perspective? We live for today. We live for eternity. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, I'm so grateful and thankful for this opportunity to be able to teach again. Father God in heaven, I just I pray that what I uh, what I spoke was in line with your truth. 
Father, we're able to take this knowledge outside these walls and, Father, live for you completely, fully, day after day, because that's the example that was left behind by your son. Day after day, minute after minute, it was for your glory. Yes, uh, so grateful and thankful for all that you've done and you continue to do for us. That's probably in Jesus' name.
Good morning. Good morning. Today's reading comes from Luke 24, 36 through 53. And while they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. He said to them, Why are you troubled and why do you doubt? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he said, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it for joy and were marveling. And he said to them, Have you had anything here to eat? And, he said, and, he get, and they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that Christ should suffer and rise again from, from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witness of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifted them, lifted up his hands, and blessed them. And he, it came out, came about that while he was blessing them, he parted from them, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually praying, continually in the church, temple praising God. Liam did a great job, didn't he? <laughs> First time. Let's give him a hand, guys. <clears throat> it's pretty fun uh, to see those younger guys get up here and uh, to participate. Uh, really uh, grateful and thankful he did an awesome job. Song number 894. Uh, 894 is what we're going to start out with. Uh, Beulah Land. 894. 894, uh, Beulah Land, we'll sing all three verses. Uh, I've reached the land of love, love divine, and all its riches freely mine. Here shines undimmed one blissful day, for all my night has passed away. Oh, Beulah Land, sweet Beulah Land, as on thy highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea, where mansions are prepared for me, and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. My Savior comes and walks with me, and sweet communion here have we. He gently leads me by his hand, for this is heaven's borderland. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on thy highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea, where mansions are prepared for me, and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. The zephyrs seem to float to me, sweet sounds of heaven's melody, as angels with a white robe throng join in the sweet redemption song. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on thy highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea 
Where mansions are prepared for me And view the shining glory shore My heaven, my home forevermore All right, 902 902 will be our next song this morning 902 Draw your attention to the bulletins <clears throat> Really uh, grateful and thankful for the VBS as is featured on the front of the bulletin. Uh, I think <laughs> really pretty amazing uh, the job that was uh, done uh, on VBS as a whole, a uh, job that was done on uh, Goliath there, and uh, grateful and thankful for uh, all of our young uh, kids that we have in the congregation. I'm also thankful for these pictures. These pictures getting sent to me. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that takes the most time on the bulletin is picking out the pictures. So it's actually really uh, helpful to me to have those pictures sent to my email. So thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Um, if you want to look on the inside of that bulletin, we have some announcements. The Bellevue Revival is this coming weekend. So um, be aware of that. It starts Registration starts at 6 p.m. Uh, this Friday. So keep that uh, in your prayers. Keep that in mind. I'm sure that it, uh, if you still want to go, they were wanting registration, but if you still want to go, uh, send uh, Kristen uh, a text and, uh, or DJ a text. Uh, I'm sure it would be uh, more than welcome uh, for you to come unannounced, and it's easy for me to say that as I'm not coordinating it. Uh, but, you know, I, if you give, uh, give Kristen or DJ Doty a text, uh, I'm sure that will be great. If you need their number, let me know. Carpet fun number is in there. The Pennsylvania family camp dates are in there. Spiritual warriors lock-in dates are in there. And the Lancaster's lady spa uh, dates are in there as well. Mission of the month is the carpet fund. There will be a presentation on that uh, at the end of the month. Uh, excited uh, to get going on that. Continue to keep the outreach of the saints in your prayers. Uh, Bible studies. Uh, thankful and grateful for breaking the fast this past Thursday. Just as a reminder... Sometimes I don't do a, as good of a job as Mr. Harbour used to do about putting our upcoming dates uh, in the bulletin. Uh, breaking the fast is the first Thursday at 6 p.m. every single month. So every month at 6 o'clock on the first Thursday is our breaking the fast. Um, we come, we contribute uh, food, and then we break the fast together. We pray and fast for evangelism uh, on those days, and then we break the fast together uh, at 6 p.m. And then... Um, the first uh, Lord's Day uh, of the month, uh, we also have men's meetings at 9 a.m. And so uh, just kind of keep those things in your mind um, when you're planning. Continue to keep, um, I'm also thankful for Bryson's safe travel. Uh, continue to keep Pat nicely in your prayers. Um, the Lori Walker, uh, Paul Kiefer, Douglas Parent, Skip Heckman, and opportunities there with Skip and Dennis. Brooke Buckingham, I don't have uh, an update on Brooke, but continue to keep Brooke, uh, you might remember her as Brooke Renner, uh, in your prayers. Um, keep her uh, and her husband Jacob uh, and the baby in your prayers. Thankful that Bill is feeling better. He's given me a look because he got on the list, but he wasn't feeling good on Thursday, so what can I do? Uh, <laughs> it's your wife that added you, by the way. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> It's that woman you gave me, God. <laughs> yeah, that worked out pretty well for Adam, too. Um, so uh, keep uh, thankful that Bill's uh, working or feeling better. Um, Andrew Adamski. Um, some of you guys might remember uh, the Adamskis. Um, Andrew is the name. This is senior. Uh, keep him in your prayers. He had surgery uh, this past week. Um, and uh, this past week was... Um, it was Abby's birthday as well. So keep, keep that family uh, in your prayers, uh, the Adamski uh, family in your prayers with um, Andrew's surgery uh, and then uh, kind of the, um, being close to the time of year when Abby's birthday would have been. I didn't get any other uh, prayer requests. So if you've got anything, go ahead and fill out a slip. The slips are right there on the podium. Uh, get those to me and we'll get them announced uh, so everybody can be uh, praying. So let's sing song number 902. 902, and then uh, I've got uh, David Mann down here. Uh, he will have our prayer uh, for us. 902, uh, we'll sing all three verses of this. 
What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Let's pray. Lord, we're very thankful for those things that you've watched out for us, Lord, the thanksgivings we have, Lord. We know that you keep everything in mind, Lord, and that everything happens according to your schedule and according to your plan, Lord. And we pray that you could look out for those on our prayer request list and so that they might right, be doing better, Lord, to glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen. song for the Lord's Supper this morning is 903, 903, there's power in the blood. We'll sing this with a little bit of extra tempo. 903, there's power in the blood. Uh, Matt will have some thoughts for us uh, around the table, and uh, Dennis has our stewardship meditation this morning. 903, uh, let's sing it with some vigor, all four verses. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin saints are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power.
Good morning, saints. Good morning. We'll be looking at John chapter 12, if you'd turn over there with me. We've been working through the book of John in our Sunday school time and Sunday evening, Thursday nights, um, and we're in chapter 12, and there's a verse in here that just kind of jumped off the page and spoke to my heart, so I thought uh, I would share it and thought it would be a good uh, place for us to focus our minds as we come around the table. John chapter 12, and I'm just going to look at verse 27 here. John 12, 27, reads like this. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Man, that verse just really speaks to my heart when I read that verse. We think about Jesus in the flesh being fully God and yet fully man at the same time. It's a hard concept for us to wrap our heads around, but the scriptures teach that very plainly, that he was God in the flesh. The very one who created all things, the one who spoke the sun and the moon and the stars into existence, the one who fashioned mankind out of the dust of the ground, God Almighty in the flesh. And it says here that he, him speaking, he says, now my soul has become troubled. You know, it's hard to think about the God who created all things having a troubled soul. Jesus was agonizing in his flesh about what was before him. We come around this table because we've been redeemed. We've been raised up and we've been seated with Christ in glory. But that came at a tremendous cost. A cost that Christ agonized over when he thought ahead what he had to do. What it's going to take. It rocked him to his core. Look at Mark chapter 14. See, the Apostle Mark also records Jesus' grievances, his how he was thinking in, in the days and the events leading up to the cross. <clears throat> Mark 14, verse 32, reads like this. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and he, be, and he began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Again, this is the creator of the world speaking. Saying, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Again, we, mankind doesn't generally think of God Almighty as one who would be suffering like this emotionally and who would be grieving in his heart and his soul and his mind over what he's about to go through. But that's because mankind often makes the mistake to recognize the humanity of Jesus while he was here on the earth. Hebrews chapter 2 teaches this very plainly. If you flip over with me to Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, it reads like this. Hebrews 2.14 Therefore, since the, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse tells you why he did it. And he might free those through, who, through fear of death who were subject to slavery all their lives. Again, more of the purpose why Jesus did it. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. 
everything that transpired with Jesus and his humanity on the earth was so that he could come to our aid, so that he could, he knows what we go through. And we can come to him as a faithful high priest who, who knows our sufferings. He, he realizes what we're going through because he's experienced all of it. Let's go back to John chapter 12. Take this one step further. Back to John chapter 12, the second part of that verse. So even though Jesus was grieved and felt all this anxiety and fear leading up to the cross, just like we would. We would be feeling anxi anxiety and fear and nervousness. and I mean, it would, it would be very distressful. Even though, look at what he says in the second part of 27 there, John 12, 27. And what shall I say? You know, after he's made the point that he's become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this hour I came. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Jesus knew what his purpose was. And there was no emotional, no feelings that were going to prevent him from getting the job done. Because like Adam taught in his Sunday school lesson this morning, he prepared his mind for action. He overcame that fear, that anxiety, by pressing on to victory for you and I. It was worth it. You know, even though he felt all that fear and that anxiety, it was worth it. You were worth it. The glory that he was going to bring to the Father was worth it. Returning to glory to be with the Father to redeem all of mankind, it was worth it. Last point. You know, we're going to be tested in this life too. Not to the extent Jesus was, probably. But we're going to, be, we're going to go have some trials. We're going to have some tribulations. And there's going to be people watching and observing us. How are we going to handle it? Father, save me from this? Or... For this purpose I have come, so that I can overcome, and that those who are watching, they can see my faith, and the Father can be glorified. For this hour we have come, to be victorious in our lives. So as we think about how the Father, Jesus in the flesh, pressed on and was victorious, it should spur us to do the same, because it's his strength that we have. He indwells us. Let's think about that as we pray. Dear Lord God, we do humble ourselves in your presence as we gather around this table this morning. Lord, as Matt has demonstrated well in his message that you paid it all for us. We didn't have to march up that hill and we didn't have to suffer the way you did. You chose to do that and you chose to do that for us. You've also chose your people to gather around each Lord's Day to remember the price that was paid. God, you have taken the sting out of death. You have taken away all our excuses, and you have given us the hope of glory. And because of that, we gather together to remember the price that was paid for our redemption. As we take this emblems, we remember your body and your blood, and we march on to fight that good fight. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
morning. morning. I was looking at uh, our stewardship during the week, and I said, you know, we come up here each week and we, we talk about stewardship, and I think we got a pretty good idea of what stewardship is and what the word means. But, you know, everybody else is talking about how the Internet can't be wrong. So, you know, I, I had to go on Google and look up stewardship just to see if the world had it right, too. And I looked the word up, stewardship, and it says, and I better put my glasses on so I can actually read it. <clears throat> First of all, there was many different definitions for stewardship, which kind of surprised me. I chose this one because it was simple and easy. <clears throat> the job of supervising or care of something. And that didn't really explain a whole lot to me, so I looked at the word care a little bit. <clears throat> and that's really where I want to go this morning, the care part of stewardship. How we need to care for what's being taken care of. And I just lost my... I looked up the word care as well. And it says, if you say that someone does something when they care to do it, you mean that they do it, although they should do it more and, will, and more willingly and more often. And I thought, well, that's a good point. So let's go with that. We need to do things more often and be more willing to do the things that have been put in our care. That becomes our responsibility as God lends his graciousness to us and says, here, use this and have that. Everything that we have has been given to us by God. So how many of us can say that we haven't been blessed by God? Well, none of us. Just the fact that you're breathing is a blessing from God. But there have been people in the scriptures that demonstrate this even better, I think, than we can for ourselves. Um, I want to look at Genesis, the 33rd chapter, where Jacob is going to meet Esau. And this is his return trip after a long time working for a couple to gain a couple wives and a and uh, a bunch of children, grandchildren, and all kinds of things were taking place. And, and uh, Jacob worked really hard to get to that point. As a matter of fact, the reason he got there was because he was told by his, his uh, mother to go, or his father to go after he stole the blessing from Esau and caused a little bit of an uproar. Um, Esau was going to kill him, if you remember. And he Mom and dad told him, get out of town. Um, don't take a wife from Canaan. Go down to my, uh, your mother's brother's land. Find a wife there and come back. So he does this. And the whole journey, and we're all familiar with it. I don't, I'm just kind of narrating a little bit of it to get to the scripture. He was prospered by God. He did very, very well the entire time that he was away and he's coming back with a, a small army, children and wives and you name it, goats and livestock. And in verse 33, starting in verse 5, there's uh, one verse I want to read here. It says, he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, who are those with you? So he said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. It goes on to talk about all the other people and all the other things that he was given. And then down in verse 12, it says, Then Esau said, Let us take our journey and go, and I will go before you. But he said to him, My Lord knows that the children are frail and that the flocks and the herds which are nursing are a care to me. I want to point out here, in the New American Standard, it says, a care to me. I don't think anybody else has that translation in their scripture. 
That's the reason I chose this scripture because I think it expresses what was going on with Jacob in his heart. He had a care for the things that God had given him, that he had been graciously given. He was caring for it. He was doing it more willingly, more often, and he was trying his best to return what God had given him. We have the same responsibility today to take the things that we have been given and make it better. If we do that, God's going to find favor with us. Let's pray. Our Father and God in heaven, Lord, we're so grateful and thankful for, Father, the life that you've given us in your Son, Christ Jesus, and Father, how you have brought us into your family, the church. Father, you have made us stewards of, of your body, the church, Lord, each one of us, as we've been given uh, unique talents and abilities and uh, things that we can do, Lord, things that we have possession of even. Uh, Father, you've asked us to be stewards of it all, uh, everything that we have uh, been, that's been given to us, Lord. And I pray, God, that as we think of our stewardship and your kingdom, that, uh, God, that we would we would want to be invested in it as we realize that it's your church that's going to, Father, be responsible for the souls of mankind and the ministry thereof and getting souls, uh, Father, to heaven. I just uh, pray that as we think on that and think about how important each individual soul is, Lord, that we would be moved in our hearts to be invested in your kingdom, to put our talents, uh, Father, and our time and our abilities and every material thing even in our possession, put it to use for your glory. And so the kingdom and the church, Father, can move forward. We thank you for all that you do and for the awesome God that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, two to five year olds uh, can follow uh, Mrs. Roberts and uh, Mr. Mann uh, right out of here. Really appreciated the thoughts around the Lord's Supper table and the stewardship meditation uh, this morning. You know, when Matt was talking, it's really pretty clear that purpose puts power into living. You know, if, if you have a great enough purpose, um, then, then the power. Uh, that the Lord supplies uh, will be given to you. And that's really the, the power uh, that you have is dependent upon how deep uh, your purpose uh, actually is. The uh, 6 to 11-year-olds uh, can follow Mr. Roosh right out of here. And as I really appreciated Dennis's thoughts about um, care and, and the approach that we take, uh, one of the scriptures that kind of came to my mind during that was... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse uh, 10. 
It says, according to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. Each person is to be full of care the way that they are going to build. And you are responsible for the way that you individually build. So build with care. So great thoughts uh, for the stewardship meditation as well. Mr. Harbor, come preach to us. All right. Can you believe it's August already? Now, all year we've been talking about the body of Christ. And I got to looking at it being August. And I got to looking at some material that I still have to cover. And I hope I get it covered. Of course, you know, I was probably a little lax in my planning because, um, you know, Marshall preaching every other week now is cut down on... Uh, Some of you know that a few weeks ago, I went to uh, Cincinnati to a music venue, Riverbend, and I went to hear John Fogarty and ZZ Top. Turned out a mutual interest. My friend uh, Anthony in Glencoe, Kentucky, pointed this concert out, and he knows that I have a great affection for old rock and roll. So when Anthony asked me if I'd be interested in maybe coming down and attending the concert, I said, well, you know, maybe we want to see if anybody else would like to go. So we asked uh, Mike Nadad and his wife, we asked uh, Ethan and his wife, and Jess Moore. Well, Anthony and Jess and Mike and I went to this concert. And I'm you, it was great. It was really good. I, you know, Don Fogarty sang all the old uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival hits. You know, I see some of you nodding, you know. Bad Moon Rising, you know. His son actually plays the guitar in his backup band. And, and what can I say about you know, ZZ Top? They are the longest surviving rock band with the original members in history. Of course, as one of them said, there's only three members to the band, so you never get a tie vote. <laughs> I shouted. I clapped. I sang along. I did that head bobbing thing that's about as close as I get to dancing, you know. What a great time in the Lord. What did he just say? A great. Mike, these aren't even Christian rock bands. Sounds more like a Rolling Stone review than a sermon. I thought you were supposed to be a preacher. Wasn't there drinking beer and smoking dope there? I did see people with glasses of beer. What about avoid the a very appearance of evil? The body of Christ is all about relationships. We tend to 
compartmentalize the sacred and the secular. Sacred, of course, is the Lord's Day, coming around the table, prayer meeting, Sunday night, vacation Bible school, lock-ins, family camps. But secular is real life. Work, hobbies, side hustles to pay the bills, school. But this is a false compartmentalization. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, a hundred percent of the time. If Jesus is Lord of all, then he is certainly Lord over his own body, the body of Christ. And if he is Lord of all and Lord over his body, a hundred percent of the time, then he is Lord over all of our relationships. The seats that we had at Riverbend were sacred spaces. God was there because the body of Christ was there. And where love is being forged, where there is relationship building, where wounds are being healed, God is there and it's sacred space. Kayaking down the Maumee River, even with dead catfish. I heard about that. Is a sacred gathering. Teaching city slickers how to shuck corn. Cooking meals. See, if the body of Christ is there, whether it's the back porch, whether it's in the truck stop, whether it's at the coffee shop, whether it's on the way to Kansas, whether it's a, uh, whether it's a Wednesday night Bible study, God is there. In Jesus' earthly ministry, when he was walking in his Adam suits, the, the, the highways and byways of Galilee, Jesus was a hundred percent kingdom a hundred percent of the time. He did not spend all of his time in the synagogue, the temple, or praying. Now, he did spend time doing those things. But he spent a lot of time just hanging out with people. Not just to minister to them. <laughs> he did a good deal of that. But he went to parties. I mean, I know he went to at least one wedding feast. He went to dinners. Luke tells us he dined with prostitutes, sinners, and tax collectors. My point is, Jesus, the body of Christ, the, the physical manifestation of God's love, the, the person of Christ, he relied on relationships with people. He was a relationship builder. He wasn't taking a break from the kingdom, 
You would think that that would be a big clue as to the holistic view that we should take about the body of Christ. What Jesus was doing was he was manifesting the kingdom. The body of Christ is all about relationships. God is love, and love is a relationship. How is the how is the body of Christ to do relationships different than what the world does? There's a lot of people at River Bend that night. How is the body of Christ to do relationships different? It's kind of had a running theme this morning in the Gospel of John. John chapter 17. I kind of like to tell people this is the Lord's Prayer. The example that he gives us to pray is our Father which art in heaven. That's commonly kind of referred to as the Lord's Prayer. But what we see here is, is a unique insight into Jesus Praying to the Father. We'll kind of pick it up in the middle. John 17 and verse 21. That they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me. And I in thee that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, Thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Let's pray. Lord God, in heaven, your love for us is beyond measure, beyond scope, and Father, certainly beyond my uh, feeble attempts to try to bring this, Lord God, to an even greater understanding that we might be able to have an insight into the tremendous love that you have for us. I pray you would help us today to see this prayer, to be the answer to this prayer. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. The love that has that you have loved them as thou hast loved them and as thou hast loved me. The same love. John 17, 21. As thou, Father, art in me, I in thee, that they may be one in us. That thou, verse 23, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. The same love 
that the Father has for the Son is the same love that God has for you. The same love that you have for me, Father, I have now given to them. That is mind-blowing. We're not loved with a secondary love or a derivative love or, or some kind of a watered-down love. God loves us with the same love he has for his son. God's whole being is favorable towards you. The love that unites God throughout eternity is now uniting himself towards you. What a privilege, the body of Christ. He loves his body. And God's love is not just manifested in the vertical aspect as he pours his love into us that they all may be one, but that love is how we relate to each other. Now God's perfect love is replicated to us through a vertical relationship. Extend across all the way up. And see that God's love is being poured into each individual without restraint and without without bounds. See? That that's the vertical relationship. The horizontal relationship then is to have that same love for one another. That, that prism reflects the perfect love of God. A mirror of his perfect love. A mirror, if you will, of his glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being changed into that same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. Go back to the prayer. And the glory which thou givest me, Father, I have given them, that they might be one, even as we are one. I don't want this to be a shock to your system. Things don't seem to be working that way, do they? I mean, I don't want to be a you know, Debbie Downer. Things don't seem to be working that way. Why wouldn't God answer Jesus'
we seem to have a whole lot of the opposite going on. Have you noticed? People are mean. I mean, that's right. People are mean. Mean spirited, displaying the spirit of the world. TV is mean. Social media is mean. People are mean to each other. In the last 40 years, I've even experienced some meanness in the church. Why can't people just disagree? Why can't people just say, I don't agree with that? No? See? How quickly when we resort to name calling, pigeon holing, pointing with a broad brush? See? That, you know, we hear it in the media. And, and we hear it in society, and, and we watch people do it, and that stuff starts to filter. See the meanness on TV, the meanness on Facebook, the meanness on the social media. It starts to filter into the church, and I'll be honest with you. Not all my relationships have consistently reflected the perfect love of God. If yours have, I will gladly surrender this podium to you, and you can tell us how you did it. My horizontal relationships get broken. Why? What's wrong? What's wrong with me? Don't everybody answer that. I'm sure all of you We don't have all day. But why is this world so messed up? In a fallen system, not a, not a fallen man, not, not a fallen system, there's a tendency to pin the blame on somebody else. All the way back to Adam, it's that woman you gave me. It's the serpent okay, playing the blame game. Today, it's those pink pantyhose wearing progressives pushing their pusillanimous power, pumping out poisonous propaganda to a pompous generation that worships possessions. I don't know if I can get that all out. <laughs> or it's that gun-loving, Bible-thumping, narrow-minded Trump lovers that are to blame. I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you what's wrong. It's the, it's the Muslims. All those things avoid the question, what's wrong with me. Anytime our horizontal relationships are fragmented, it means that our vertical relationship is fragmented. Our capacity to reflect God's love to others is completely dependent on us receiving God's vertical love. The health of our horizontal relationships can never outrun the health of the vertical relationship. We can only give what we've received. We cannot crank this out consistently on our own. 
That's how the world might know that God sent Jesus and has sent the body of Christ into a dark world. But we know this. We, we groan. You've heard the illustration of a God-shaped vacuum. But, but you know, Paul says that, that the, whole, uh, the whole creation uh, groans so that we wouldn't be unclothed. That, that we would be brought up in, into, uh, that God would give us the earnest of the spirits. And, and that causes us to, to desire to have that, uh, to answer that prayer. We want to be loved. We are born with this addiction. The need to count. The need not to be alone. The, the need to be significant. The need to be secure. But we can only be overfilled with the love from that vertical relationship if we are already filled to the brim. To be filled with the love of God We've got to trust God completely. Oh, who could love me? I'm a worm. I'm a sinner. I'm no good. God probably loves everybody else, but man. But a correct picture of God is a God who is trustworthy. He means what he says. That's why proof that the Bible is the word of God is essential because it proves that the Bible is the word of God and it proves that God is trustworthy. Now, not even God can pour anything into a cup with a lid on it. See we put a lid on that and don't believe that God is trustworthy and we reject that. God can't fill us to the brim. He can't even get anything in there. You, you put that lid on your heart and, and that, that lid actually creates a, a suction. You start to feel like our lives are insignificant. Like our, our life doesn't really matter. Like, man, you know, my life's really not important. If we put a lid on our heart, creating a vacuum, we suck. <laughs> We're like black holes sucking the idolatry of the world and trying to find our significance, our security, uh, our, our, uh, our reason to go on from these idolatry, from this idolatrous world. It becomes about uh, how much I can get, uh, how pretty I am, uh, how many toys I have, uh, how can I stay maybe nominally involved and not really be a team player. Because, of course, my family has to come first. Or maybe even having, a, having a, a Bible study at Fulton Manor with no direction. 
If we're not overflowing, we're sucky. And instead of entering into those horizontal relationships with, with, the, uh, uh, with the love that, that we get from God overflowing, we begin to, to suck the life out of other relationships. Eh? We, we start to feed on relationships. It starts to become a, a quid pro quo operation. And instead of a relationship of abundance of love and overflowing, we, we tend to then start to, at some point, suck the life out of the relationship. Because basically, I'm going to use you to fulfill some need in my life. And you're going to use me, to some degree, to meet a need in your life. What? Well, um, you, you hear, uh, hear this on the, you know, romantically, uh, you complete me. If anybody says that to you with a romantic interest that you complete me, then you tell them to go get a life and come back. That doing God's job is above your pay grade. <laughs> you can, oh, the only way it makes sense to me that you can love your enemy is when your core needs are being met by that vertical relationship. All of our horizontal relationships are dependent on that vertical relationship. And the emptiness that people walk around with is the source of, I would say, all the conflict in this world. So we need to invest deeply in the vertical relationship. Now, never been one to say, you know, every head bowed every eye closed. But I do want you to think about this picture. This, is, this has helped me. I want you to think about God's love like Niagara Falls. Cubic tons of water coming over that precipice. The source never being depleted. Millions of gallons a minute coming over Niagara Falls. And at the bottom of the ravine, The water crashes on me as a, a pebble, drowning me in endless love from an endless source. That water is overwhelming me. No shortage of feeling this free, unstoppable gift of God's love. Loves me the same as he loved Jesus in the flesh. I 
I feel significance because God's love is pouring <coughs> onto me 24 seven. No source of, of scarcity. I drink it in, it, it bounces off of me, overflowing then in love for others. A lot of people live their lives out of a sense of desperation trying to get full. God answers prayer. He is answering Jesus' prayer. He is eager to answer Jesus' prayer. The body of Christ can live freely and abundantly out of a sense of fullness and out of a sense of celebration. Life is meant to be a dance, not a struggle for survival. But until we get that <coughs> vertical source, that picture in our mind to focus on, and really that picture is simply Christ in glory. And we are being transformed into that same image by the love of God. I'll close with this. John chapter 7. I think we've stayed in John all morning. John chapter 7. John chapter 7 and verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Consult the source. Believe the source. Allow the source to fill you up. And horizontally, people will know that we are Christians by our love. My hope built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Because, brother, none of us can pull this off on our own. It's going to take the indwelling of God's Spirit. The way to get God's Spirit is to be baptized for the remission of sins. And Peter said, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the divine in you, which then opens up that lid to receive. Let's make sure that lid opening, that circumcision not made with hands, that the flesh doesn't sneak back in there, try to close that vessel back off. Let's stand. Let's sing. If you need to make a decision this morning, won't you come? Uh, 583, uh, we'll sing the first. And the last verse.
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Verse 4, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. For us to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Logan, Roby's not here, so you're going to come pinch him. Come pray. <laughs> here, you have this. I'm I probably got too much anyway. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you that we can assemble together um, and hear your word. I pray that we can go out and be effective in spreading your word and be safe for the rest of the day. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. 6.30 tonight, keep that in mind. Bellevue Revival, Carpet Farm, Pennsylvania Family Camp, Spirits of the Warriors, Lancaster, uh, Lady Spa, Mud hens on the 18th. Anything else I should announce? Adam wanted to mention too. Get the get the payment in for the mud hens tickets because um, he's got them. So and they're already paid for on the church cards. So. Okay. All right. Adam wants some money. So <laughs> if you sign up for tickets, you pay him. So happy birthday. Denise. The other birthday.